10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2... Drag Racing fans, how's it going tonight? It is another Tuesday night, and it's time for the Competition Plus Power Hour. So, I know you guys have been up on the tires and floating those valves all week, but we are here to calm everything down, pull you back into the pits, and talk a little drag racing. I've got my co-host on. Lee, how is it going on this Tuesday? Hey, Tuesday is going great, man. We're already beyond Monday, strolling on through the week, and wow, what a week was it last week in the world of drag racing, and I think a bombshell was dropped today even concerning the world of pro mod that I uh, will we'll bring up, we'll talk about and chat on that we'll cover, uh, go back to really a lot of what we've been talking about that, you know, look, pay attention uh, sanctioning bodies and teams, and let's get some uh, variety happening up in the pro mod world once again. So, hey, got a lot of folks chiming in saying good evening. Thank you, Too Fast 65. And uh, yeah, Joe, look, it's time to kick the tires and light the candles and uh, destroy your 1320. Folks, check out his channel when you get a chance. Good to have each and every one of you on tonight. Let's talk some drag racing. Sam, where do you want to begin? We got a lot to chat about. Opening first, like, I want to thank all you guys that send in emails and everything like that. So we're just going to do the housekeeping first. Power Hour is on all your major social media platforms, right? We are on YouTube. You can watch us back if you don't see the whole live video, if you come in late or anything like that. And then you guys can listen to us on the road. So if you're loading up that trailer, if you're in the shop, please give us a listen and a like over there in the podcast world that's all your major platform but first thing i want to talk about is the storytellers episode of roy hill pat musi and ricky smith we had those three gentlemen on here but now we're going back into some more things they're telling more of this it's just cool to kind of see the storytellers you know when when that comes out and everything it's going to be cool to see some of the little things that we didn't talk about on there and all the great information that, you know, competition is putting out, competition plus is putting out. But then I want to talk about, first off, 20 NHRA said something that was really, really like good for the sport. When everyone's talking about all these rumors of um, the Wild Horse uh, Motorsports Park and them getting away from NHRA and everything. And they say, no, wait a minute. Let's pump the brakes here. Let's not continue this rumor. We will be back in 2022. So I, I, I want to know kind of, Lee, how do you feel about that, knowing that NHRA is saying, hey, just because you may have heard some things, we will be back. We're just, we're, we're taking our time right now. Well, you have the announcement made that 2021, they're not going to go to the Wild Horse Pass Motorsports Park for the Arizona Nationals due to COVID reasons. And then shortly after, matter of fact, I saw it for first through Leah Pruitt's Twitter feed, and that was retweeted from another source. It was this photo that I'm going to bring up right now. And this is a site plan by the authority that's over Wild Horse Pass and connected with the reservation that they're on. And if you look in this plan, you can find it on the web. Uh, there's not a racetrack there. There is a sports comp, there's sports complexes, there's restaurants, there's parking lots, there's resorts. But there is not a drag strip. There is not an off-road course. There is not a drag boat lake. Wild Horse Pass Motorsports Park looks like it is bulldozed over. But that's not the end of the story. The fact is, I think most people saw that photo, they ran with it, and in running with it, they, well, missed what the article said. The article said that, one, it's a concept, and two, that it's like a 40-year plan. It's not next year. 
So, Sam, it seems to me a case of, well, the Internet taking things a bit too far just from one image. And as you alluded, right here on CompetitionPlus.com, the source for all your drag racing news and where you can believe what you read on the Internet, yes, there was a statement from the NHRA that they plan to be back and hold your horse, not horses, you see what I did there? Hold your horse for Wild Horse Pass Motorsports Park because they plan to be back in 2022. So, be careful. It, be careful. It is, and, it, and it's one of those things. We're human, right? We see something. We see someone else retweet it. We we kind of start falling. I, I call it the rabbit hole, just like you are when you're, you're on YouTube or uh, now TikTok or whatever it is. You start scrolling. You start seeing stuff. And you're like, hold on, wait a minute. Now you look at a picture here, you look at a picture there. So it's easy to kind of see. And first thing you look and you're like, hey, there's no track there. But you didn't continue, you know, we, we all didn't continue to read down and say, hey, wait a minute. This is a concept. This isn't just the full outline thing. So I get where it's coming from. Uh, but it is, I think, like I said, it's great to see that NHR is saying, hey, no, no, no. We're not going to continue down this road. We're not going to continue to have people say all this stuff and spread rumors. We we just want to nip this in the butt, and this is kind. Of, this is what the plan is. So I, I I really like you know seeing that that is reassurance for you know like people destroyer. He says makes me sad. That's twenty minutes from my house. So when you have people that are in the industry in you know, connect it to racing and to have something taken away from them that's right there. It, it's really uh, refreshing for NHRA to come out right away and just say, no, wait a minute, let's pause. This is what the plan is. Yeah, to lose that facility, it would be a blow definitely to drag racing, but not just drag racing. You know, it's a drag boat racing facility. There's boat racing that happens beyond even drag boat racing. There's an off-road facility. There is a, a, you know, exotic car experience and driver instructor school there. It would be a blow to motorsports, really, I think, in the region that Phoenix is sitting in. So hopefully Wild Horse Pass Motorsports Park has got many more years, or if it doesn't, Maybe in the plans down the road, there is a revamping in another location in the same market. I do want to say this, though, Sam. I hope, I hope that with this bit of a scare, that the Wild Horse Pass Motorsports Park management or whoever is in control will really look at their fan service. The first time that I was there was in 2020, and I was shocked. It is one of the most challenging fan experiences I have ever personally had. So even though I have credentials and I'm able to get in and other gates and things of that nature, a lot of times I try to go through the fan gates because I want to experience what are the fans going through. What's it like to walk from general parking up to the main gate? And one, not that long of a walk, but a long walk. When I got there, they said, well, that we, we're not allowing you to bring any drinks in except one bottle of water. We're not allowing you to bring any snacks in. You need to purchase everything at the track. Oh, your tripod. We can't let you have that in. And by the way, no professional cameras whatsoever, which is a, a term that's a bit, well, what do you mean by professional? I mean, I, I mean, I know of one super fan, John Charbonneau, uh, he has been to over 400 national events. He was there at that event, and they gave him heck about his camera. And he is a great amateur photographer, and it wouldn't be any professional long zooming type of setup. So I definitely think they need to look at the fan experience and check themselves and say, hey, you know, if someone wants to bring a pack of crackers in, my goodness. I mean, what does a diabetic do? That's silly. Well, I mean, in that case, they might have something that there but i get what you're saying and i think uh, and i i talked to someone else a couple of people here this week uh you know as i'm doing a few live shows you know in the week just to kind of promote the talk of more drag racing as we need we hear a lot of people saying that but i think the fan experience from what i can see in 2021 is going to be a little bit different still with the COVID restrictions and different things that we still have going on in society. But I think people are gonna try and do things a little bit different 
just to try and make that that connection again. Like, I mean, granted, we've all, you know, we all want to get right back to normal, but with these circumstances and whatever you want to believe in, um, there, there's going to be guidelines. But I think drivers, teams uh, are going to try and do things a little different to make that connection. And I think actual tracks too will realize, hey, if a guy wants to come in and take a picture, let, let him, I don't see, you know, it's a, it's a different point of view. I get it. You're trying to protect the people that are in the media industry like yourself and myself. But at the same time, we have to be able to open up because who knows what can come of that. That can be, you know, the next best thing. I mean, granted, you and I, I mean, let's let's break it down. You and I started, you know, like I said, walking through those main gates, being able to just be the fan that cares and loves the sport and now look at us. So I don't think taking that opportunity away from them is a bad thing. So I think we will see a little bit of change and I hope we see a little bit of change in the way that these tracks are doing things, interacting with people and understanding the circumstances that we're in today. Definitely as a body, you would think any racing organization, any sports organization, <laughs> bring your cell phone in, bring your camera in, give us all the free exposure that we can get. And you know what? Frankly, some of the media guys, if they got challenged by what everybody else was doing, why not? Some of them need to move from where they've been standing for the same 30 years and get something different for once. And I'll say this, and we got Roger Richards in the comments, and he's watching. Roger's good about he will get that starting line shot, and then he'll pan and get the shot of the scoreboards and them going down the track. I've seen photographers literally take their starting line photo and they look down at their phone, look down at, excuse me, their camera, and they're not even getting anything else. They're like, oh, I got what I wanted. I'm not getting anything else. What are you doing? How is that actually covering the sport whatsoever? So, yes, I think more the merrier. Bring all the exposure that you can and put eyeballs on the sport. Before we move on, I do want to say, Tammy Powers, thank you for chiming in. Thank you for your encouragement. Folks, she works for Alan Johnson Performance Engineering, the man. So, Tammy, thank you for tuning in. Appreciate all your support. So, Sam, look, there's a, I mean, a small, relatively unknown race happening this weekend in the state of Florida. I think a lot of things are happening in Florida. A lot of things are happening. We talked about this. Florida is kind of a hotbed right now for racing. I mean, Arizona was for the dirt track guys, but uh, I think right now Florida, Florida's a place to be. What do you, what do you, what are you implying there? I, you know, I know there's a couple of racers down in that Florida area. I've been following them on um, on Facebook, but but what race are you talking about there, Lee? Give me, give me, give me some more. Well, Bradenton, Florida, is big, you know, big time right now, and you First have race got. Here. We know, honestly, it has become the streetcar nationals down there has become this race. It's kicking off the pro mod season, kicking off the door slammer season. Granted, you could argue that the door slammer season never stops at this point, but it is that first true test of the year and of the season for folks to get ready. And now it's not too far followed after the World Door Slammer Nationals. I mean, some great things happening. Hey, it was good to see Mark Caruso back in the pro mod and making a hit today. I, that was very cool to see. I was, yeah, I was going to talk about that. And see, I think this race, I'm going to, I'm going to say this and I'm going to hate saying this, but guys are, I think right now, guys are going down and they're, they, some people are still kind of, testing the new stuff that they have to do and, and getting comfortable like Mark Caruso, getting comfortable back in that car after, you know, some time off after the crash and having other people drive the car. But I think this is a good stepping stone for him for a huge race that he, that his team has to come back and, and do great things at. And, and that is the door slammer nationals uh, that's going to happen at OSW um, that drag illustrated C tech manufacturing and, all the slew of uh, sponsors that they got going on. But I think, like you said, this has become like the start of the year. Granted, 
they never really take time off to, you know, like your in like your some of your NHRA guys and and girls. But I think this race is kind of what we need to kind of break the ice of everything and just say, hey, 2021, here we come. Hold on. Because I think this weekend you may see one or two people trying to set the world on fire. I think that's definitely going to happen. They're going to be shooting for it. Conditions usually are right, and you hear some great – Unexpected news out of that event most of the time. Uh, Mark, uh, he asked, what about the uh, testing for the NHRA? Uh, what I am hearing is that there's going to be some testing at Gainesville. Uh, yes, others are mentioning Palm Beach. Others are mentioning, yes, they're going to be doing some at Bradenton. So what I've heard right now is that there's going to be people testing individually, possibly some gr small groups before the Gator Nationals, and then there's some testing days right before the Gators. So possibly, in essence, two testing sessions at several different spots. So, Sam, look, talking about the inside stuff, we need to bring in our pit insider. Maybe he can clue us in on some testing things. Folks, right after this word from Competition Plus Apparel, by the way, I got some T-shirts and masks in there. Nice. Get some of your own. Right after this break, Jeff Arend. Get your competitionplus.com apparel today. Whether it's our nitro burning funny car design or the vibrant door slammer design, we have the swag to show you are always in the know. Get yourself a hat too. And we know not everyone enjoys wearing a mask, but if you must wear one, at least wear a good looking one. Check out the new competitionplusapparel.com for the latest from the place where you have trusted for your news on the internet for over two decades. Jeff, Jeff, Sam. Jeff. Hey, what's Sam, up, guys? Wait, wait, let's introduce him properly tonight. We have on oh. the jeweler. The jeweler. The jeweler. <laughs> yeah. That's what's going, going back on? a long time, guys. What do you got for us tonight, Jeff? What, right, what's on the hot things. seat? A few things. So you guys were talking about testing. So uh, definitely there's a uh, an HRA test at Gainesville uh, right before the race. So there be some teams there for sure. Uh, even out in the West Coast, I've heard that uh, probably third week in February, you might see uh, Dell and Alexis out there testing her car. And uh, Tony Gerardo with his brand new funny car is going to be out testing. So always exciting to see new teams coming out there. Uh, so that's kind of cool. Uh, going on from there, what else did I have? Let's see. John Force. Had, uh, what, two top fuel and two funny cars last year. So I think uh, one's going to be missing. So you guys are going to have to figure that one out yourself. But uh, I think only one top fuel car is going to be out there uh, in 2021. Uh, and then we're going to go through a few questions here. So I got four questions from Dale Hadley from last week I didn't get back to. Uh, what The first one is, how much fluid usually comes out of the puke tank on the average and do you empty it after every run? So on a normal run, you might get like a cup of stuff out of there or so, but if you burn a piston or blow it up, you'll have a lot more. And uh, I'd say the smaller teams probably empty it after every day, like after two runs. But if you have an event, you're going to empty it right away because you don't want to have all that stuff in there. If you burn a piston, you'll just end up blowing it in the track and get a, and get a fine, which uh, nobody wants to donate to the uh, NHRA management fund. So that's the first question. Second question. Uh, when you dyno your superchargers, do you try and get them as close to each other as possible? Or are there different parameters for certain ones depending on track or atmospheric conditions? What are the conditions you would have to change superchargers during a race other than the damage to a previous one? So most teams, uh, the bigger teams have blower dynos and they're able to, to dyno them and, and see what they flow. Um, I would say for the most part, when it's brand new, you might get an extra pound of boost or so. But most of the big teams will make a couple of runs on it, and then they'll restrip them for the next day. Uh, there are certain things you can do to make them a little better. You can go through them and blueprint them, which basically means putting strips in them and, and making sure the end frames are in the right place and just all the clearances are, are correct. Um, and some teams will change them on race day after a couple of runs because they get really hot and they don't want the superchargers to be hot. They want them to be cold so that the, the fuel mix is definitely more dense. So... Uh, You'll see those guys, some of them will restrip between runs. They'll put the inner strips in them rather than the outer strips. But generally, one or two runs on the bigger teams. Uh, some of the smaller teams will leave them on longer because after the first run or two, when they go down a pound or two in boost, 
you can just run the blower, you know, 1% faster than you normally would and end up with the same boost anyway. So not quite as critical. Maybe when the air gets bad, you want to have your better blower so you don't have to spin it as fast. Um, next question he had was, how much difference in time during a run is there, if any, between a five and a six disc clutch locking up and going one to one? Uh, for the most part, they're kind of in, in the same parameter. The big advantage of having a six disc, especially if you're slipping it a lot, it's not going to try and weld. So a five disc clutch has like less area of surface area. And obviously, you're missing a disc and a floater. So as they get hot, they have a tendency to weld. And when they weld, the motor will go from like, say, I don't know, 7,500 down to 6,500 in a tenth of a second. If the track's good, it's not a big deal. But if the track's not good, that shock is going to make it spin the tires. A six disc clutch, you generally run the motor a lot harder. The RPM stays up higher. It never really locks up per se. It locks up eventually, but it's a very smooth transition between as it locks up. And what that allows it to do is not have that shock load or spin the tires. It also allows you to dissipate more heat. As far as ETs go, if the, you know, if the track's really, really good and the, and the conditions are fine, there's probably not a big difference in performance between the two. But the advantage of running the six disc and running your engine harder is that the engine stays up higher. It doesn't pull down to 6,500, so it stays up above 7,000. You have more boost, more fuel, more power, and, you know, theoretically, it should make you run better. And then uh, last question he had was, are there any advantages or disadvantages of doing a short burnout, like, you know, like a Jim Dunn or a Jim Head? So besides the obvious cost value of, of nitro, and a lot of people don't know, you use more nitro from the time you start it to the time you stage it than you do on the actual run. Uh, you know, a modern funny car idles somewhere around four gallons a minute. So you're thinking, you know, if you run it for an extra 30 seconds or, or 60 seconds, you're going to burn an extra few gallons of fuel. And nitro weighs pretty close to 10 pounds a gallon. So if you have your car balanced pretty good and you, you end up being 10 or 20 pounds light on the front end, that's a lot. So I don't think there's a big advantage or disadvantage of the long burnouts. I mean, I like the long burnout. They look better, but you want to have some uh, fuel in reserve just in case the other guy has a problem. And then, of course, the weight makes a big difference. So instead of bolting on, you know, 20 pounds of weight on the front of your car, just do a short burnout and have that fuel in reserve and you have that weight there. Now, uh, Sam said he had some questions for me, which I'm not sure I want to answer, but I'm going to let him have a chance. <laughs> hey, so so like we said last week, we got to find a little bit of dirt on on you, Jeff. So kind of kind of snooped around a little bit, and we're going to call this the dirt section. So I got one question for you, and it's tell us about the hill coming into Hamilton. The hill coming into Hamilton. So you're talking about going to Cayuga. So I can only remember one really exciting time that I had a friend of mine was towing my car. I had a like a 70 Chevelle back then that ran like tens, a cool street car. And there's a big hill kind of going down. It was on an open trailer with a pickup truck. And he was going a little quick. And I said, you probably want to slow down a little bit. And he got on the brake. And I don't know if you know, but the trailer would start to fishtail back and forth a little bit. And it started getting worse and worse. And we went over like three or four lanes. Like we were in the other lane going down there like sideways both ways. Eventually it stopped. A little scuff on the paint. But I think the more damage was done to my buddy and I from like the waist down. <laughs> All right. That was that. So that was the first <laughs> question. And then, and then the second question uh, we have for you is ask about the 1990 Pro Stock Race. Uh, versus Mike. 1990 Pro Soccer Racers versus Mike. I don't know if I have an answer for that one. I'm going to need a little bit more information <laughs> on that. that. That's all I've got there. There's a there's a few more questions, but we're going to save those for next time. But no, hey, we're, we're just trying to slowly get to know who the insider, Jeff Arin, is. And, and, you know, we got a good, reliable source that's uh, giving us a little dirt. So if anyone out there, don't forget, Email us any questions you have for Jeff at powerhourcp at gmail.com. Or if you have any pictures or any, you know, good information we should know on the show about the Pit Insider, please let us know. Uh, let I us may know, or folks. may not be on next week. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, it's getting too hot already. I don't know about this. I don't know about this. <laughs> <laughs>
I have to but, cool myself off a little bit. Uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, he, he wants to get back to the party and around the bonfire there and enjoy the rest of the evening. Look, Jeff, thank you. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Folks, by the way, Jeff is on my show Thursday night. Between the Slicks airs 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the Monday Morning Racer YouTube channel, Facebook, and Twitter. So more with Jeff Arend. He's one of my guests this week. Jeff, thank you for your time and giving us – those inside tips. Uh, no problem at all, guys. Have a great show, Sam and Lee, and uh, I'm sure you will with Amanda and Frank on there tonight. Oh, yes, definitely, yeah. definitely. Thank you, sir. Speaking of Frank Hawley, we do have him in studio. We'll be bringing him in shortly, and we're waiting on Amanda Busick. She will be coming on. Those are our guests tonight, great guests spanning the long history of drag racing. Sam, though. There was an announcement, a concept picture thrown out today for ProMod. And I'm excited to see new names in the sport. I'm excited to see new sponsors. I'm excited to see new brands. But I think they're missing the boat with this right here. Is it just me? Or does that not look like a Toyota? I think it's, I saw it, and and when you see it, you're like, okay, yes, but I think it's kind of a a test run, per se. I, I, that's what I'm going to say it is. It, it's a test run. We're going through. We don't want to change too much. We don't know what the year is going to look like, so let's give it a try and see what we can do. Well, it's exciting to hear that Jeffrey Barker is going to take a crack at the full NHRA Pro Mod Tour. That is cool. Two-time NHRA Sportsman Champion. But, man, I really feel like if they come out with a, in essence, Camaro body with a few accents and a Toyota sticker stamped on it, they're going to miss the boat. And they're not listening. Like, everybody is saying out there, we want things that look like your actual OEM counterpart. And then you come out cool. with this you know, hybrid Toyota Camaro? What in the world are they thinking about? I mean, come on now. Let's 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 be honest here, Lee though. Can you really really make a Camry look? Now if you like want to go Camry? down that road, if you want to go down that road, <laughs> yes, I think it I, ought to be a Supra. <laughs> it ought to be a Supra. Don't get me wrong. I think that's what it should be. Nothing against Toyota there, and, and honestly, nothing, but can, I mean, I, I don't know. I, 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 no, I understand. I understand. Look, <laughs> he's got a sponsor, low Toyota. I get it, but they got to work on something. Come out. If it's got to be fiberglass, I don't care what it is. I mean, I, I don't care if it's plaster. Come out with something that looks like the doggone Toyota, actually. Please, I just, please. My, I just don't. No, I, I mean, I just, even trying to picture your Camry SE going down the track, it's like, no. Now, if we're at the rental car race, you know, rental car drags or whatever, cool, whatever, fine, fine. But I, that's like seeing, that's like saying, okay, it's a Ford Runner and it's going down. I just, no. Tacoma, yeah. no, I just, no, I, well, again, I, like I have no problem. I have no problem with Toyota being in the sport. I don't care if it was a Civic. Just make it look like a Civic. That's my thing. Now, wait a minute. And see, I was going to bring that up. Now, if Honda, you know, came in and did like a CRX or, you know, one of the different coupes back in the day or the Acura Integra, you know, so, you know something like that. No. Hell, hell yeah. I'm with it. I mean, we all grew up watching. Paul and uh, Fast and the Furious. I mean, come on now. If you didn't, then you're just saying you're lying. We all did. 90 babies, we rule the world. But I'm just, I, you know, I, I just don't see the Camry, but I do see a Honda Civic or a CRX. You know, I right. see all the hatchbacks, the all coupe, even the Jetta. I mean, I know, okay. you know, everybody remembers that everybody remembers the Jetta, but 
All I got to say is whatever I see, I want to see it looking like the car it's supposed to look like. We got to get back to that in drag racing, I think. And I think that also solves another problem. It's going to slow them down. Everybody's like, oh, they're too fast. I mean, I agree. Make them look a little stock. Take some arrow out of them. I mean, make them be, have a little bit more drag because of the way they look. I, I got no problem with that. Do it. Do it. No. Then I, no, I think we, there, there has to be the concept, and I get where you're saying, make them look a little bit more drag. But if we start veering off to where they look like what we see on the streets every day, it, it takes away a little bit from the drag racing. I get it. We, I love door cars. I, I I love them, love them, love them, uh, but it, it's a slippery slope. It's just like I kind of feel the same way about this as the electric car. I just don't make it look too much like a Camry or don't like because next it's going to be the Buick. You know, you're going to have the grandma car and not say anything about Buick, but no one needs, you know, the Buick Regal machine running down the track well dude you got the wrong make and model it's buick grand national they need to come back out with that and it'd be a turbo pro mod i could do that that could be pulled off i mean yeah yeah see see man i tell you look, look I, I won't say this and we're going to end it with this but we got to bring on frank and we got to bring on amanda if that thing is a camaro with toyota stickers it isn't an abomination that's that's it that's what I'm saying. It's an abomination. We're taking a break. We're coming back with <laughs> our guests right after this this episode, this commercial. See, I, I just, oh, this commercial from Jerry Bickle Race Cars, and hopefully he builds an actual looking Toyota. In the race for quality, there is no finish line. Jerry Bickle Race Cars is a one-stop chassis shop for drag racing performance parts and race components. For over 50 years, Jerry Bickle Race Cars has been an essential part of racers' plans for building world champion race cars. Our parts department is stocked with every part a racer might need. Log on to jerrybickle.com for more information. We build anything with doors. jerrybickle.com Hey! Hello, Frank. Okay. Hello, Amanda. How you guys doing? Dang, no doing warning. Great. Back from commercial, we're on. Back from commercial, yeah. yeah trying, you know, it, it's, it's, it's professional on Competition Plus. All I know is, in comparison to Frank Holly and his background, we're all losing. <laughs> the, the man is chilling over there. The man is chilling. It's, it's, it's tough living down here in Florida. It's in the high seventies today. Oh. It, it was it was kind of distracting out here because the there was a light breeze and the palm leaves were kind of blowing, and it's just distracting sometimes. And uh, <laughs> I'm working hard. I, I, wow. It was negative. <laughs> it was negative forty this morning when I woke up, and you're talking about seventy degrees. Yeah, I'm living wow. in the wrong place. Wow. Uh, all, uh, you know, rain all day here in uh, uh, kind of central North Carolina. So, well, I, I grew yeah, up, thanks, Frank. Thanks. I grew up in Ontario, Canada, and I had uh, I had my fill of uh, road slush and grime and gravel and frozen key locks and and all the stuff. But uh, uh, Jeff Arend and I grew up not too far from each other. So uh, we both, um, even though we loved our country up there, we both ended up uh, in, in uh, opposite sides of the country, but uh, in warm climates in, in the United States, and we're loving it. Well, you're, you know, right. I mean, you definitely cannot do racing up in, you know, I was in Western New York for a while and into Canada. There's a definite w racing window, unlike Florida. Like, that's all year round. People can do that just about all year round. So, and I'm sure that's one of the reasons why you have such a close relationship with Gainesville Raceway and you've got the school there. Talk to yeah. us about that relationship. Well, we, way back when I was driving for Austin Coyle and the Chi-Town Hustler, I had, uh, I went to a road racing school, actually, uh, the Jim Russell British School of Motor Racing. And uh, that gave me the idea of, probably trying uh, a drag racing school, which no one had ever done. And we, uh, to shorten the story, we 
knew that we needed to be somewhere we could run 12 months a year. We actually thought about Southern California, but uh, uh, there was no racetrack there at the time that we could run uh, all the time. And, and uh, NHRA owned Gainesville Raceway. So we thought they would be the perfect landlords because we were contributing to the sport. And uh, uh, as opposed to just uh, rental income each month, they might see that we're of more value than, than, uh, than, than just the income. And so we got a hold of uh, uh, Wally Parks at the time. And uh, uh, Wally and Barbara Parks uh, uh, helped us get a, a lease signed with the track and, and get our school going. And it was just great. And, and before I forget, I do want to say something that if you guys want dirt on Jeff or Rend, we can, <laughs> we can talk because I, I mean, Jeff and I. Call great. me. Call uh, me. Send us an email. I Jeff, just got one, actually. Jeff works for me now. He worked for me for about a decade when we were in California. He ran all our alcohol cars. Great driver, great mechanic. He's he's an all-around uh, racer. He can do a little bit of everything. And uh, uh, I, I, I really like Jeff. Uh, but there are probably few people that know more inside stuff um, there's nobody that knows as much as I do about Jeff Wren. So we'll, I'll get you some good stuff. I have a question for Frank. Just coming off the comment that John said, that's my teacher. Frank was my teacher too. But uh, when you look at the current roster of NHRA drivers, how many of those are yours? And of the drivers that have gone through the Frank Holly Drag Racing School, how many championships do you have? Um. <clears throat> So I don't know the exact number, uh, uh, way over half of the current professionals, uh, you know, we worked with early on in their careers and some of them later. Um, last year we had five of the NHRA world champions uh, were, were our graduates. So we've had an opportunity over the years to, uh, um, to, to just work with a, 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 lot of, a lot of people and new drivers. So Austin Proc a year ago, and Justin Ashley, you know, they're both uh, rookies of the year. We, we, uh, they, both of those drivers got started with us and, um, we're, we're just re really blessed. I mean, I grew up wanting to spend my life in drag racing. Um, and, uh, and, and I got to, you, you know, I was fortunate, right place, right time. A lot of people helped me, but, uh, we're, it, it's been just a, a, an amazing three decades that uh, we've had with the drag racing school and, and not just the champion drivers, but one of the things I get most excited about is, is we get somebody that comes to the class, maybe they've never driven before and uh, they really like it. They go out. Uh, we ask all our students, all our graduates to stay in touch with us and it'll be two or three years and we'll get an email back from uh, one of our students. And they said, Hey, I was in a class, you know, three years ago. And uh, I just won my first uh, Super Pro race uh, Saturday night in nowhere, Oklahoma. And it's a picture of them standing holding the, the trophy. And, and for us, that's that's just as, in, in a sense, just as rewarding as seeing somebody win an NHRA championship. That's awesome. See, Lee, it, it's hard to ask the good questions. Can you hear me, Lee? Yeah, I can hear you, Sam. Oh, sorry. I was saying it's hard to ask the good questions when you have someone like Amanda on because I had that question down on my notes like, okay, I, I want to ask this, but then she goes right ahead and she knows what to ask right away. So I have I have a good question for you there, Amanda. I you know follow you on your socials, but the cool thing you did with this whole kind of crazy race season was the airport. You know, every time you went through the airport there and the tally of, oh, first one, and then it kind of caught on. Is that something you will continue for 2021? Oh, yeah. So here's what, and by the way, it's so nice to meet you, Sam. Uh, I got a question for you on the end of it. Like, are you mad, bro? I got to ask that. But so the thing with that video, that's the Atlanta airport. Um, I get that question all the time. Where are you? Where are you? And they have this jungle installation that uh, you walk through and it just it's kind of one of those things that when you're on the road, things become habit. So for me, even if um, let's say I it's so it's between the A and B terminal. So even if I land in C, I'm going to go to A and walk from A to B 
or I'm going to, the, the train doesn't exist from A to B for me. It is broken eternally. So that's, uh, that's kind of the one thing that I kind of do. But this year, hopefully, uh, so instead of, um, I would post it with the same bit of the song, the in the jungle, the mighty jungle. I'm going to try to do the whole song. So I'm going to start from the beginning and see how far we get into the song. So we'll see. <laughs> I like that. I, I like that. Like I said, it was kind of catchy and I caught on to it and I'm like, all right. So how many times did you go through the airport by the end of the season? I think I hit probably 16 or 17, but I mean, 2020, you can imagine, um, you know, travel was way down at our end. Um, I currently have um, 33 weekends booked with events this year. So I think we might have a good chance of getting through that song. So we'll see. <laughs> or there you go. Yeah, there you go. Okay, well, so you had a question for me. No, I was going to ask you if you're mad, bro. Oh, no, never, never mad. Never. <laughs> I, sometimes. Sometimes. He's rarely mad. He's you were rarely mad, mad about that uh Camaro bodied Toyota. There, okay. There's only a what? few things that gets me mad. And there's Amanda, that one. I, I was good, Amanda. And brought it back up. Th it I was mean, that. And then what else was there, Lee? There was one that you and I. Oh. It's kind of like Lee and his cereal. The electric, the electric car. car. I, I, this I, is what I, happens no. when you leave your guest in the waiting room. Uh, no. Right, right, yeah, yeah. You cannot come into the waiting room until, right, definitely, definitely. <laughs> hey, hey, guys, so if, if you want to look for the origin of the uh, the kind of uh, odd-looking body, you've got to go back to Kenny Bernstein in the 80s. Right. Uh, just after I drove, you know, Frost and Coil, and uh, they had uh, some basic rules for the bodies. And um, Dale Armstrong, brilliant crew chief and designer, and – and uh, a few other guys that worked for Kenny got together and came out with what uh, was a Buick at the time. I know you were slamming Buicks a minute ago, but uh, it was a <laughs> Buick. And, uh, uh, and we called it the Bat Car because it looked kind of like the Batmobile and it looked nothing like a car. And at that time, uh, maybe somebody should have said, we can't do that, but uh, they allowed it. And, and that was, in my mind, kind of the origin of... Uh, uh, the, the odd looking cars, but uh, before I forget, I don't, I don't, I wanted to say this tonight. I didn't know Amanda was going to be on the show tonight until just a little while ago. And uh, we all know that she's uh, extremely competent as a, as a reporter and, and an interviewer and, and just a, a wonderful uh, uh, host. Uh, she came to our drag racing school and, um, a lot of times people think if you can do one thing, you can't, if you can do one thing well, you can't do something else well. And I think there were some people, not that worked for me, that thought, well, I don't know if she's going to drive a car well because she didn't have a racing background. And uh, she drove the wheels off that little super comp dragster, trans breakdown, wide open throttle, great 60 foot times. And uh, there, there were a lot of people, I think, that after watching her drive that car thought, wow, she's, she's got a lot of skills. And I, I just had to, had to put that out tonight, too. Well, I was going to ask, like, you know, how, what kind of student was Amanda Busick? So that's, that's some high praise there, Amanda, from um, Mr. Holly. There you go. Uh, truthfully, it is because of Frank Holly. Uh, the way that he runs his class uh, I learned more about myself as an individual going through Frank Holly School than I did about driving. Obviously, you, you go through the class, but uh, the psychology around it, the psychology around reaction time and thoughts, and it was um, lessons that I get to apply in even my job that I have at the top end. Um, you know, whether you you know, there could be a thousand things happen at the top end, but I need to be focused on the one thing that's happening right in front of me and um, picking up those lessons at uh, with Frank Holly. And um, I, I see all the comments of people saying that they were at the school and, and went through the Frank um, Holly drag racing school. Uh, I'm sure they have very similar feelings of learning more about themselves uh, on top of uh, having an incredible drag racing experience. And 
I was ready to jump right into a top alcohol car, but uh, the car on uh, site of Jim Hughes in Tucson did not fit me, but I was going to do it and was talked out of it. One day. Ah, ah, that needs to happen. That needs to happen. Can I ask Frank another question? Go ahead. Go I know, ahead. I just, I'm just curious because I, what do you think of, what do you make of Justin Ashley's reaction times? Um, he's good. Uh, you know, the reaction time thing is, it's, it's relatively complicated. There's a lot of things involved. Uh, it's not just the driver, uh, but clearly the driver's a big part of it. And, uh, you know, we spent a lot of time with Justin. He started in our super comp cars and went through our alcohol program. Um, <clears throat> you know, he's, uh, he, this sounds simple, but he doesn't overthink it. Uh, he's really, uh, uh, you know, has, is able to clear his mind. And, uh, you know, that and the car was working well for him. Um, you know, so there's a combination of things. But, you know, if you get a few in a row that are really, really good, then what happens is everyone starts thinking that uh, uh, they're all like that. And, you know, if you look at Justin's reaction times, he certainly has some that, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're good. But, you know, there's a lot of good drivers out there. And continuing on that topic, I want to know for you, Frank, when you have a guy that's really good in the classroom – does that always portray over to the track or do you have people that are really good on the track and don't have it all in the classroom? Uh, I, I guess I'm not really sure what you mean in the classroom. I mean, uh, uh, you, you know, the reviews we do in the classroom is pretty much just getting feedback from uh, uh, the drivers on, on how they thought they did and, and how they performed. Uh, most of what our classroom is other than reviewing the driver's runs is, is some lectures that I do, which Amanda had talked about. Um, so I don't, I don't really separate the, the, the two things. Um, you know, ultimately what, what we're after is, is good racetrack performance. But I think uh, one of the things that I get a kick out of, I thoroughly enjoy is, uh, is talking about stuff that we can uh, use, use drag racing as a, as, as a platform to kind of, get the message across because that's where we're all there to do is drag race. But there are things that we get to talk about that apply to a lot of other things in life. And you would wonder how that could apply to Amanda's job or, or playing golf or uh, you're a fighter pilot or a golfer. And uh, the, uh, the common elements there are that we're all people and we all have a lot of stuff in common. And, uh, uh what, what I enjoy about the sport is the, is, is the people and the, the human uh, factor. And so uh, that, that's what I've kind of focused on over the, the years. And, and uh, I've been doing this for over three decades and I still love it. So Frank, we've already seen the puppy come into screen. So share with us, uh, who's your buddy there? Uh, that That's Abby. And that's our golden retriever. Abby, come on over here. Come on, come on over here. Everybody wants to see. Come here. And she is. Uh, she she runs runs the house now. <laughs> we'll get Abby down here. There's Aww. Abby. <laughs> what a sweet puppy. <laughs> so Abby pretty much runs things around here. Um, <clears throat> and uh, that's that's our only kid at home anymore. Our uh, our boys are growing up and, and gone away. So we we've, we've got uh, we've got Abby. Well, we're glad to have Abby on the show too. Amanda, how do you like your chili now? Oh, uh, with uh, dirt and black boogers, apparently. Someone forgot to tell me that. <laughs> I didn't uh, get the memo that, uh, that uh, the next day there was going to be colored uh, things coming out of my nose. So uh, I'm used to, you know, more on the green spectrum of... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if we're going to go TMI on that, just FYI, you go to the chili bowl, you're going to have dirty boogers. <laughs> wow. I don't have you. There you go. She, you know, she is on. She's got an honest streak. She's done TMI before on my show. It's like, Amanda, hold, whoa, hold on now. I mean, no, was, we, I we've got enough. So um, uh, there's a couple guys from Gateway that I connect with a lot at a lot of motorsports. They tend to be at whether it's the Indy 500 or and they happen to be at the Chili Bowl. And I was on a group text with them all weekend 
Um, they had uh, kind of a, an area that was um, a little in the corner so you could kind of escape some of the fumes um, and some of the dirt. But um, I texted both of them the next morning. I'm like, uh, you guys didn't tell me about this. And they, I guess it's like an initiation thing that people think is kind of funny. So I hate to spoil it for everybody, but um, look forward to that. Um, but no, it was incredible. Um, for those that haven't been to the Chili Bowl, definitely put it on your bucket list. And uh, I don't think that, uh, or I know that I didn't get the the full experience. Uh, the amount of team, even though there were still 300, the amount of teams were limited. Obviously, capacity in the building was limited. Um, but it, it'll definitely be on the list uh, from here out. It was uh, uh, exciting, um, just edgier seat entertainment, even for the A main, the 55 laps on Saturday. So uh, be there. Stellar, stellar. And so that folks know your background, you're not unfamiliar with dirt, just not indoors. You know, uh, our home track was 311 in Madison, North Carolina. And it was, uh, uh, I don't I think, it, I don't think it's a, you might know better than me. It's not a, I think it might be a half mile track. I don't think it's a quarter mile track. Um, but it's uh, outdoor, uh, sit in the infield, very open, just loud. What is 311? I think it's a, ah. I mean, I was like sure. seven, eight. It could be a quarter mile, but I, I, it, it, things are bigger when you're younger. <laughs> That and you know, dirt tracks they do something funny. It's like, okay, did you measure from the top or did you measure from oh, the bottom? That's a good point. You know, yeah, yeah, you never, it's hard to tell sometimes with dirt tracks. Hey, at least in drag racing, we know quarter mile, thousand feet, boom, that's what it is. That's what it is. So, looking, um, I guess a question for you, Amanda, is you know, you do your thousand foot um walk with, with the drivers and everything like that, but. If you like when you leave motorsports and when you look at, OK, when it may be over way, way in the future, what do you want to leave as your legacy on this sport? I mean, you've done a lot of great things and being a phenomenal woman and mentor for people. But like what legacy do you want to leave on motorsports for women? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, for women, you know, I hope that I'm just uh, a part of being able to make sure that the next generation is willing and ready. Um, I look at, uh, and I say this a lot, but 11 a.m. on Sunday is, is no better place that I'd rather be. Uh, that top end position is the perfect place for me. Um, I didn't know how much I would enjoy that spot. Uh, I don't, uh, you know, a lot of times I look at the motorsport space and there's reporters that, are, you know, whether they're more technical or they're more uh, on the history of the sport, I am a human interest reporter. And if there's any legacy or if there's um, a hope that that I strive for is I really, um, you know, during my work, I'm thinking of the audience. And for me, it's connecting them to the broadcast. If they're sitting on their couch at home, am I asking the question that they want to know, whether it's comfortable or not? Uh, you know, we're put in some tough positions sometimes, you know, not everyone, you know, you're not going to have a stellar day at the track every day. And um, to make sure that I'm being authentic uh, to our fan and to be able to represent NHRA fans. Uh, I love the idea that that they can, you know, talk to their friends and say, hey, you guys should watch this race because they're proud of what we're doing. And um, if I can leave that as a as a legacy and and make sure that um uh, we give these drivers a platform to showcase their skills, talents, and personality, um, put a bow on it, and, and that'll, that'll be a um, very fulfilling career for me. That's awesome. And then I know a lot of people are asking this question, Frank, uh, but the long burnout, when you look at, you know, drag racing right now and you look at your career with the long uh, burnout, who do you think resembles that the most in today's drag racing? Uh, you mean who who's doing long burnouts now? Yeah, who who would you say is comparable to your long burnouts of today? Well, the the sports changed a lot. I mean, uh, the, the really long burnouts. Uh, uh, <clears throat> weren't necessary then and they certainly aren't necessary now 
Uh, when I went to drive the Chi Town Hustler, Pat Minnick, the original driver, uh, was I think he was credited for starting the long, super long, smoky burnouts. And of course, people picked up on that, and, and it was a big part of the show. And when I went there, Austin told me, listen, we need to do, you know, they, they talk about half track burnouts, but really, if you smoke the tires for 150 or 200 feet, you're going to stop about half track and the smoke stays with the car and it looks like that. <laughs> but uh, uh, they got to the point where there's more money involved now. Uh, the, the pressure to perform has, has increased. Uh, it's, it's uh, even more business-like than it, than it used to be. And uh, they're doing what they need to do now. Uh, just, just enough as Jeff was talking about earlier, where, you know, the, the length of the burnout isn't arbitrary. I mean, you have a team, you have a way you run the car, uh, you know, you're, you're on the time from when the engine starts until it shuts off the finish line. That number needs to be the same all the time. Uh, so that everything's the same temperature, the clock's the same temperature, you burn the same amount of fuel out, you take the same amount of time, and it's way more structured than it used to be. So uh, that's why you see uh, uh, they've shortened up the burnouts. Um, they could probably do less than they they even do now. Uh, some of the drivers you talked about have even shorter burnouts, but it's it's more about performance and consistency now than than just the showmanship uh, uh, so yeah, things things have changed a lot. Gotta love a good championship winning burnout though. Right, <laughs> take it out. Where was it? It was two years ago where Robert took Mona. it yeah. and had to get out yeah. of the car on the track. I don't think NHRA was real happy about that, but fans no, love it. <laughs> they were not. I captured. You can see this on the Monday Morning Racer Facebook page and in my review, uh, dragging at the Fairplex on YouTube. I caught footage. I was in the perfect spot. I caught footage of John Force with I call them gray shirts. Uh, and if you and if they're wearing a gray <laughs> shirt, they're somebody. And uh, I, I look at them like they're part of the Empire or something. But he, it was him and two gray shirts. And I have never seen NHRA officials so animated. And John so animated. I was like, I'm about to catch a fight. <laughs> it was it was wild. It was wild for sure. Hey, we're so, talking about yeah. It. yeah, it was wild. It was wild. But uh, I liked what Jack said on that burnout. He's like, man, I, I've been driving good all day, but I got a car sitting out there. I got to keep it in my lane <laughs> with Robert Height's car yeah, that, sitting that out there. That was, uh, from the safety side standpoint, of it, I could understand why the NHRA was, was very upset with that. Definitely, definitely. Hey, Frank, we have you on right now, and like even in your name, you've got Frank Holly's Drag Racing School, and everybody knows you as instructor, but you had a great career. You drove and piloted one of the most prestigious funny cars in funny car history and connected with Austin Coyle. You know, when you look at kind of two careers – which one is most rewarding or did one set up the other one? And, you know, do you miss kind of folks introducing you as, Hey, funny car driver and not just instructor? Well, <clears throat> clearly if, if I hadn't had an opportunity to, to race and drive all those good cars, um, I, I don't think I would have had any credibility to uh, start a, a race driving program. So one, one uh, started the other. Um, I, I had a great time driving. I mean, I started when I was 16 years old. Uh, my parents helped me. We had old front motor top fuel car. We were on fire all the time. We were the guys that everybody was complaining about. Uh, I wouldn't recommend that to anybody, but that's, that's what I did. Um, <clears throat> we raced, I raced six or seven years, uh, starved to death. We had alcohol funny cars and and um, anyway, I, the, the last six months of my uh, own racing career before I went to work for Austin Coil, I was sleeping in my truck in, uh, in Southern California for six months and uh, uh, before I got that job. So, so Austin kind of rescued me, and, uh, and that was my first real good job driving. And then I, after, after the, the deal, when, when, when Austin Coyle left, or they folded up the Chi-Town team, he went to work for John Force. At the time, uh, <clears throat> I only had about a year or so off, and Larry Miner called me, and uh, Larry had the Miller 
uh, sponsorship. Uh, Dick LaHaye drove a dragster. Larry drove a dragster and Ed McCullough drove the funny car. And Larry didn't want to drive anymore. And uh, <clears throat> Larry called me and, and, and I got to drive uh, the Miller top fuel car for a few years. And uh, that deal ended. And then uh, unfortunately after that uh, is when Daryl Gwynn's accident happened. And Daryl uh, asked me to, uh, uh, to if, if I'd finish out the Coors contract for him. And so I drove uh, for Coors for a few years. And, uh, and then, you know, we ran the school for quite some time. And then Roger Burgess uh, and Mike Ashley uh, were some pro mod racers. They built some fuel cars. And they gave me an opportunity to come back in, in the late 2000s to uh, get in, you know, contemporary nitro cars. So I feel like I've always been in and out of the seat uh, over the years. Um, but the school thing allows me to be to do a lot of things uh, that, that you can't do as a race car driver. And that, that's the interaction with, with our customers and the time we spend talking about just so many different things. And... Uh, um, they're 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 both rewarding, but in in completely in completely different ways. So Frank, it was uh, it was you back in like the late eighties. You had the cool, awesome maple leaf helmet uh, with the gold and all that on it. Wasn't that the case uh, with Larry Miner? Uh, yeah, yeah. I had uh, it, it had a little maple leaf on on the uh, the front of it. I'm, I'm surprised you forgot. I still have that helmet. And, oh, really? Uh, ooh, ooh. Yeah. I'm pretty sure, Frank, you held a microphone, too, didn't you? Yeah, I, I, I got a chance to do some stuff uh, with with uh, Diamond P many, many years ago and, and did some color work, uh, uh, did a few shows. Uh, if I had half, if I had a quarter of the skill that Amanda has, oh, I, might, I might have been able to continue on. But they uh, they said I, I there was probably some other things that I'd be better at. But uh, I did get a chance to do a little TV. It was. I don't fun. believe it. I don't believe that. I, I agree with you, Frank. Amanda needs to come out with like a step by step for all of us to practice. You know, to get those vocal skills to talk right. I think you know this off season. You know, right before we get in, that's a new. There you go, Amanda. You can just give Here's us all a lesson so we can do it right. Go to the Frank Holly School. There, there you go. There you go. Let, oh, let me tell you guys. Sometimes you, you you can you could try and get a person to 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 dance and they can't. Uh, so here's here's something that many years ago a story just popped in my head. Uh, when when we started a drag racing school, there was uh, the only things that existed in, in race driver training was uh, uh, Skip Barber and and uh, uh, the Russell School. They had the Formula Fords. And then Bondurant had a sedan school, which I think he had Mustangs back then. And, and so we were the first people to ever start a school that had, was, was different at all. It was a drag racing school. And uh, about a year after we started, uh, uh, Buck Baker, the, the world famous stock car driver called and he said, so how, how is, uh, how's that school going? And I was really impressed uh, that he had called me and we talked for a little bit. And um, and I said, well, not bad. And, and at any rate, he started the first ever uh, NASCAR stock car school, of which there are many now. So we, we were kind of in the beginning of that. But here's my Buck Baker story. I actually got a chance to drive a stock car once, uh, which is another takes another whole episode to discuss that. It was disastrous. But at, at any rate, uh, before that uh, race, I, I went to Buck Baker's and uh, I, I walked and, and I got some training uh, uh, to prepare to go drive the stock car. So I walked, I got there the day before uh, the, the class was to start and I walked in and, and uh, I, I told them who I was and they said, oh, oh, Mr. Baker wants to see you. So I walked in and talked to him. And, and so he's sitting back with his, his boots, cowboy boots up on the table, leaning back in his chair and, uh, and he says, so I hear you're like into all this, uh, this um, psychological psychology stuff and everything, you know. And, and so why don't, why don't you tell me what you think it takes to be a good race car driver? And, and I thought, wow, this is a great opportunity. Uh, you know, I got, I got this world famous 
driver. And it, so I started on the physiology and the psychology and some brain stuff and nervous system things. And, and I'm giving them like, I'm into this for like five or six minutes. And all of a sudden I thought, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm talking too much. So I stopped and I said, well, what do you think? And, and he, he stood up and he looked at me, he says, well, he says, I think some people can dance. Some people can sing. And some people can drive race cars. And he walked out of the room. That was it. So <laughs> I think there's some wisdom in that. And sometimes people are just uh, just gifted. Just gifted. Is there any footage of your time there at Buck School? No, and thankfully so. This was uh, probably prior to cell phones. Um, and uh, actually, I didn't do anywhere near as bad at the school as I did at the race. But uh, that was not televised either. So uh, I could uh, I could make up stories about how I, I was running fourth and, and then, you know, somebody. But, but that never happened. I, I was running. Happened. All right. There's actually footage. A lot of people don't know this. I think it was a crossover on Neil Bonnet's winners. John Force actually went to Buck Baker's driving school and he's like, uh, uh that's like the hardest thing I've ever done. Never doing it again in John Force style. So there is footage out there of John Force in a stock car, actually. That'd be interesting. Those those drivers are absolutely gifted. Um, everybody's job's difficult. I mean, the, the stuff that you guys do. Uh, I mean, everybody that's good at their job has has perfected a skill and taken years of practice to get there. But you know, at that level, NASCAR drivers. Um, we just got an opportunity to work with Tony Stewart. Uh, he. Uh, He's been down to see us twice, uh, so we spent several days with him, and uh, to sit and, and listen to some of his stories, and then he talks about when he was young and sitting around listening to AJ Foy and Parnelli Jones and all these guys talk, and and so it, it was a it was great to hang out with Tony, very very humble guy, very funny guy, and and obviously just a, a, a gifted race car driver, but. Uh, um, listening to him talk about driving sprint cars or stock cars makes me realize that I, I, I know nothing about it because uh, uh, it's, 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 it's a very difficult thing to do. And, and those guys deserve a lot of credit. And speaking of that, that was actually my next question for you. Lee and I had this whole kind of argument debate last week on, or maybe a couple of weeks ago on the show. How do it's you think saying. it's what we do? Yeah, I mean, it's healthy. It's healthy. We, yeah, it, thank you. See, they thank you. But how do you think Tony is going to do racing? I mean, he's a phenomenal racer. We've seen his career. Do you think he will struggle a little bit at the start, or do you think he's coming out and going to do great things? Uh, struggle with what? With just adapting to the new car, the new driving style. But, but in what, what car are you talking about? It, which, whichever one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Information. <laughs> no, you, you got to know something I don't know. So what, what cars? I'm just, I'm, I'm saying after seeing him at the school. But you talk about him does, does his, his sprint car? No, his, Whichever drag car, because there has been talk, and this could be rumors, but we talked about it on the show, uh, and I know someone else had mentioned it, that there could be possibly two cars that he may own. Well, he told me uh, that there are no plans at all for him to do anything more than what he's done with us at, at this point. So uh, that's the last thing he said to me, and, and that's, that's what I'm sticking with. All right. See, that's that's news to me. That boom, boom. Hey, I'm 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 done. I'm taking away. I'm taking away a slammy from myself there, Lee. Mark yeah, that on the tally did. board. You definitely do. Yeah, Frank <laughs> owned on that one. It can, it became the Frank Power Hour for the the few it's moments fine. right there for sure. Definitely. Hey, so can't believe Amanda. can't believe everything we see on the internet, right? That's, that's right. You can't. You can't. Amanda, you can't believe what you see on the internet. <laughs> right, right. So, 
Amanda, you do a great job. Everyone in the comments is saying you do a great job. We've said you do a great job. You know you do a great job. But I imagine you've got the personality where there's always something else to get out there on the table. So what in 2021, in your professional career, do you want to make gains in? Yeah, oh, that's a great question. Uh, so, you know, I think it's kind of... Um, you know, while drag racing is so unpredictable and you have no idea what's going to happen for the five hours on Sunday, um, you know, the job, uh, I don't want to say it's routine, but I feel like that, uh, you know, we've had the television tr truck lose power in a race. We've had mics go out. We've had, I've been turned on on air when I wasn't supposed to be on air. So you get used to all the chaos and, and the challenges and things that can happen. Um, I got a couple of um, opportunities in the hopper that are going to happen this year. Uh, the stuff with the Chili Bowl, uh, the show that we did on MAV TV, we're going to do 11 more shows um, each month at different motorsports events across the country. Um, the majority of those I haven't been to, so it'll be uh, exciting to take in the new experience with that and to work alongside uh, such an industry vet like Ralph Shaheen there's only, you know, just a plethora amount of uh, knowledge I'm sure that I can learn from him this season. Um, and then uh, I can't announce it yet, but um, I, I get to add another uh, series to my resume this uh, year as well. Um, and uh, that'll, without a doubt, stretch my talents and um, it'll be a whole new um, kind of arena to play around in and uh, uh, be a part of uh, something that uh, we can be proud of. All right. All right. All right. Don't you leave drag racing? No, no. Drag racing is always my primary. Oh, I ask everyone, and I've told you this before, people, the, one of the number one questions I get, aside from what my victory dance would be, uh, the second most question I get is what's next. And to me, that is uh, insulting to drag racing. It's insulting to uh, the position that I get, get to hold. And um, as I mentioned earlier, I am a human interest reporter. I am that that connection to the audience. And you can't tell me that there is a better job in sports than the top and reporter in drag racing. What other sport can you talk to a participant while they're still competing? Right. Right. There is the, get no, no other sport, no other sport, you know, I'm very uh, happy. I, I don't even think we still have the coach interview going in the halftime, but they yeah. still have pulling players to do right. that all and it's contrived and it's you you know it's the what are you going to change at halftime coach yeah you know it's like the so here you know it's uh and you can only imagine the and i think that's what makes it so exciting on our side as well you know we have our athletes and competitors that you know they just battled a racetrack uh going 300 miles an hour uh and there's a mic in your face. So uh, it leads for some uh, fun interactions and um, some uh, uh, memorable interactions. And uh, I just, I feel very grateful and, and lucky to do what I do. Amanda, with that, who is one of those interviewers, you know, once they get out of the car, you're like, we have to get this, like, we need to get the, who's that person that you just are like, okay, Make sure we get that interview. I think everyone is better in the moment, right? And um, that's one of the things, you know, we tried the best we could this past season. But, um, you know, in, in terms of um, respecting the guidelines and things that we need to do on the health side for COVID, whether it was with the mask or with the distance um, from Mike um, to me. And, um, you know, it, it uh, just in terms of setting all that up, it, it gave a little more pause. Um, I like to get right in there, right next to the driver. I like to make eye contact um, quickly. Uh, and that's, you know, that's another thing that we kind of missed out on this season. Uh, wearing a mask, you you lose a lot of those nonverbal cues that um, you can read from drivers or that they can read from me. Um, sometimes uh, behind the camera, uh, when the mic's in their face, I, you know, I make facial expressions to kind of lead uh, the conversation as well and to, to let them know that they're good or um, my producers in my ear saying, get them off the screen. <laughs> so there's, there's, you know, there's a lot of things that, that happen up there that uh, people don't always see. But uh, yeah, no, it's, um, uh, 
the the sooner the better on the interview and and a lot of times if it's not just the interview i'll talk to my camera guy and say hey keep an eye on this person keep an eye um you know someone's fiery they're going to go up to this driver and um you know those things happen awesome there so um we we've talked about like the careers and different things like that you did have a couple of funny moments there this year where you and leah kind of change roles for Halloween there, you know, building these relationships for both of you guys, building these relationships with these drivers and continuing that does, you know, that's pretty much your extended family for the, for that long period of time. Right. The funny part about that. Uh, so that was one take not rehearsed and the, I've spent the last, uh, I've been at the top end off and on for five years. Uh, almost, I, I was able to fill in on a, ra on a rain show in 2016. Um, it was uh, Epping uh, and um, Bruno actually had to get to another gig. Uh, so they're like, Amanda, you're in, work the top end. Uh, and which is just crazy thinking back to, but uh, you, you recognize people's routines and you recognize, um, uh, what, you know, what, what side of the little things, like even what side of the car they get out on or what side of their helmet they talk, take off first, or if someone's going to go to the tow vehicle, cause they want to put a hat on. Um, everyone has their own sort of, um, space up there. And, uh, with the Leah video, uh, I got a ton of, uh, response. And I, even when I was at the chili bowl, I had a couple people bring it up, but, uh, I know people's mannerisms and clearly the way that Leah did in that video, they know mine too. So I'm on display as well. So it goes both ways, but uh, yeah, no, it was really fun. Uh, I, I like to look at um, drag racing as a family. I, I know everyone saw that, um, you know, even with Ron Tobler uh, retiring, uh, you know, there's many uh, weekends at the track where um, I've snuck by and he does a wine night on Saturdays in the pits. And, you know, some of my, um, you know, most uh, memorable moments have been with my coworkers hanging out uh, with that team. And, and um, you know, Hop, who we lost this past year, he was a big part of that as too. So uh, it definitely becomes a big extended family. And, um it's uh, it's nice that uh, that uh, um, sometimes people let their hair down and you get to see people outside of the track. Yeah, that was a great little skit. Uh, Leah is always out of breath and has got her arm like up here all the time, you know, and the hats turned up. It's, it's so y'all y'all nailed it. It was great. It was great. Frank, last question for you. Through your school, over the years that you've had it and, and all the accolades, great drivers to come through it, what driver that has gone on into the professional ranks has surprised you the most to go on and do what he or she has done? I probably can't, and, and, and you don't want to hear this, but I, I can't think of one, uh, one person, but uh, I'll tell you why... <clears throat> I, I wouldn't say I would be surprised. When, when we first started a long, long time ago, I think that I used to kind of have this sense that I could tell if, if someone was had the right stuff, so to speak. Uh, you know, how you looked, how you walked, how you talked, uh, what your background was, how much you hung out at the races. Um, and, uh, you know, I could line up a, a, a bunch of folks and go driver, driver, no driver, no driver, driver. And, 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 and I learned I haven't got a clue about who's going to be good driving these cars and who isn't. Um, we've seen second generation drivers where, you know, they grew up at a racetrack and their, their mom or their dad's a great driver uh, that uh, don't even like driving the cars. We've seen people that... Um, uh, uh, husband will bring his wife down and uh, she didn't really want to come. Uh, he talked her into it. She drove better than he did. So uh, we see, uh, I'll tell you one thing I want to, I want to throw in here is <clears throat> when the junior dragster program started years ago, it's got to be 25 years ago. Now uh, I thought, well, it'll be kind of cute, uh, you know, give the kids something to do kind of, 
get them involved in the sport, but it won't really be that useful because, you know, I, I know they have fast ones now, but back then they had lawnmower engines on them and uh, it wouldn't be that useful. Well, over the years, we've had a lot of second generation drivers come through. And in fact, in the last year, we've had two third generation drivers where the grandfather drove at the school, uh, the father drove, and now the kid's here, uh, which, uh, wow, that makes me really old. However, <clears throat> here's, here's my point. Uh, <clears throat> I, I've learned that I can't tell who's, who's going to be good or not. I'm, I'm, I think I'm really good at, uh, at the past. <laughs> In other words, I can tell you what you did, what, what you need to do better next time. But what you're going to do next, I, I, I don't think that I know. And I don't think I can I can pick and choose drivers. So based on that, this is answering your question, I think, is I'm never surprised by people that end up doing really well. Um, but I'm pleased. In, in other words, uh, it, it's great to see people do well, even at a local level. Again, you know, we get a, a, a kick out of people just – racing at their local track if they never go to another one or national events, NHRA racing. Um, I'm pleased that we were a very small part of, of their, um, their journey to the winter circle. And, um, and, and that's what we get, we get the biggest kick out of. Awesome. And one for you, Amanda, um, will we see more of, you as a crew chief or the backup girl for the Caruso Racing <laughs> family team in 2021? I got to check the PDRA schedule. Uh, I, I'm hoping that the Galat weekends will be when I'm actually, um, so I live in North Carolina now, not too far away from Lee, but uh, so if I can get over to Galat again, you absolutely will see me as the bug for Camry Caruso. That was one of the highlights of my year. You might as well come down to Florida oh, here in a couple of weeks. I was nervous. You can come I down to Florida and do it. You could talk to Mark or Camry about this because <laughs> here's what here's actually a background to that story. So they actually sent me to go pick up sushi. Um, and but it's it there was it was downtown Benson. I'm not familiar with the area. It took a little longer. My fault. Anyhow, I get back to the track. Uh, the car's not there. Uh, so I'm like, oh crap. She's probably at the line. So I drop my car and I start running to the starting line. And sure enough, she's going through the water box as I run to uh, the starting line. And she's just like laughing with her hands in the air. Mark's going crazy. Everyone's going crazy. So I almost missed the moment of being the bug, but um, I made it. And it was fun and I was nervous. And I'm not sure how she would rate my performance, but I'm, I'm more prepared for next time. Hey, you, you did a fine job. No shoes came off, and you didn't get stuck on anything on the track. So there you go. Yeah, she that wasn't in the visor. She wasn't looking at me, anyways. She was. She knew what she was doing. That and the visor is the staple for twenty twenty one. You have to have that all season long. Okay, we will be it. looking for it. Oh, it'll be back. I've I've, I've awesome. up the colors, so we're good. <laughs> all right, all right. Well. Mr. Holly, look, thank you for being on Competition Plus Power Hour. I, I personally just want to say honor to have you on and talk with you and definitely hope to have more converse, conversations in the future. And hopefully, maybe if I can get Mike Ashley to pay for it, be a student down at Freight Holly Drag Racing School <laughs> eventually we, myself. We have, I'm going to offer you guys a, a substantial discount right now, but you, you've got to come together and you got to do a show from the school. Ooh, and, Bob, Bob, hey, Bob. Bobby. Hey, Bob. Bobby. Bobby. Um, I'm calling into work here in a couple of weeks, so <laughs> and, you know, we'll, see, we'll see if we can get that worked out. But uh, no, it was fun being on with you guys tonight. I got to get up super early in the morning because I'm actually headed down to Bradenton oh, and, okay. uh, and going to work with uh, with uh, some of our students down there this weekend. So uh, I'm uh, I'm up, and uh, it's about a two hour drive for me. So I'm going to get up about five in the morning and head on down there. So this is way past my bedtime. But it was a special event to spend a little bit of time with you guys, and it's wonderful to see my friend Amanda again as well. Hey, Frank, anyone that can wear a Life is Good hat, uh, <laughs> I want to hang out with. 
<laughs> I'm glad you noticed. <laughs> there you right. go. And if you want to listen to any of the other episodes, they are on all podcast forums. So, you know, a couple of your drivers are on there. <laughs> Yeah, maybe maybe like all of them, you know. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, Frank, thank you. Amanda, as always, a pleasure. Thank you for being on Competition Plus Power Hour and uh, yeah, we're looking forward to you to starting your own podcast or something. Got to get that out there. Get it out there, girl. I saw it in the comment the school of announcing. Well, we'll see what we'll see uh where we can fit that into the schedule this year. <laughs> Sam, it's great meeting you. Yes, nice meeting you. Um, I didn't fangirl too much tonight, so, you know, hey. Hopefully we'll cross paths in this 2021. Oh, for sure. We we are hoping. And we'll get you a Mad Bro shirt or hoodie right. and you too, Frank. That way, you know, can have you guys repping the Mad Bro. Awesome. I'm, I'm going to leave and go take care of my dog, Abby. So you guys have a great night. All right. Go take care. Take care. Yes. Amanda, thank you once again. We will see you. I figure Gator Nationals. Hey, be there. All right. Got to. All right, guys. Have a nice evening. Thank you. I'll, I'll continue I'll you. Go back to the healthy debating. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. Bye, guys. We've got, per we've got permission again, Lee. They've That's let right. us loose. And look, I got to say, man, I won this episode hands down. You Dude. can say nothing. Frank unloaded on just, you. Just I mean, all oh, 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 me oh, oh, oh. I mean, woo. Old school. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, like you said, I guess, hey, I, I'm going to say it. You cannot believe everything you see online. I mean, that's right. That's you got right. me. He, that's you right. got me. And, Hey, Destroyer said something in the comments, and, and I really like it, and I told him we appreciate him. But he says his whole family listens to this every week. So, Lee, I don't know if you have anything, and maybe we can talk to the boss man, but maybe we, you know, uh, can send Destroyer something. I mean, every week he's on here, and he's liking and sharing and feeding in with comments. So, Destroyer 1320, I will get some gear if you personal message me. Uh, I'll talk to Bobby when we can get you something coming just as appreciation. Like I said, we appreciate all you guys in the comments that like shares, you know, and listen to our stuff and then listen to our personal stuff. Lee's got a great thing going over on the Monday morning racer with his uh, between the slicks on Thursday. You have Jeff Arin this week. Um, Jeff Arin, also so, uh, Dwayne. Dwayne is the head promoter for the Mid Atlantic Street Outlaws. Those guys have been on Discovery Channel, but got some bad, fast street door cars that oftentimes run at Beaver Springs Dragway. He's going to be on, from what I understand. So, yeah, definitely look forward to the show. By the way, folks, Destroyer 1320 on YouTube. That's his channel. Go subscribe. He will definitely appreciate that. Yeah, that's awesome. And like I said, we want to give back to you guys. Hey, I have the man, the myth, the legend. I have Wes Buck. The episode will be dropping uh, on Thursday morning. I have Wes Buck on. Um, in the Groove podcast, that's hosted by you, me, truly, Slam and Sam Smith from Outlaw Performance ENT and Mad Bro Motorsports. Uh, again, you know, like you said, don't believe everything that you read online that you see. So if you guys want to go over, and get some great news uh, directly from Wes Buck. We did talk about his door slammer race and everything else that he's doing that's coming up on my show, In the Groove Podcast on all your major platforms, Mad Bro Motorsports and Outlaw Performance ENT. Lee, it, it's been a great show. Um, I, I took a slammy away from myself tonight as I got backed in the corner, and I, I actually got the smoke um, from Frank. So, I mean – Another one to you. You're 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 catching up here. I don't I don't like this battle going into the beginning of the year. These round wins for you are uh, taking a part of my my league total. So that's right. That's right. Coming up strong, man. I I tell you what, we all need to take some notes from Frank. I've never seen anybody handle a question like that. He woo, wow. I mean, he I mean, puts straight, you in the court, straight, some face, you know, put some oh, jabs I was, in there. I was Came in with the with the haymaker. I mean, just just took Dude, took it, me out. He kind of he kind of backed me up, kind of like in that uh, McGregor fight. Dude, just backed me Dude. up, and then just boom! I had nothing after that. You had nothing. 
You had nothing. Walking out with crutches. We we got to take notes Walking on out. that. We got to do play by play on that one. Wow, wow, uh, folks, yeah. all of you, thank you for watching Competition Plus Power Hour. Yeah, join me on Monday Morning Racer Between the Slicks. That man show, Slam and Sam in the Groove Podcast. Dude, shut us down. Hey, everybody. It's been another great episode. If you got any questions, comments, concerns, please email Lee and myself at powerhourcp at gmail.com. And you can listen to us and all the other episodes on all your major um, podcast platforms. Thank you to Amanda. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you, Frank, for all the great words here tonight. But this has been another episode. We are going to shut it down, do some maintenance in between rounds, fuel up for next week, and we will see you live here next Tuesday for the Competition Plus Power.